Hey, Craig. Hey, man. What do we have lined up today? I am interviewing Joe DeSena up in Vermont during one of his insane races. <laughs> so you interviewed him during uh, his race? <laughs> yeah. Initially, we were planning to do the interview at his general store in Pittsfield, and he then told me that we were going to do it in a field in the middle of the night. I do most of my interviews at my general store. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, he uh, walked me around a field in pitch black, and I <laughs> crossed my fingers that the recording stuff was working. Um, so, yeah, Joe runs Spartan Race, and mm-hmm. then during our interview, uh, I watched military cadets stack logs and then run into the woods so they could be chased by dogs up a mountain. Is this like an official race, or is this just Joe hanging out with his military buds? This is a beta test of a new kind of race that Spartan will be putting on. That I won't be joining. That you will probably not be even invited to join. (laughs) This podcast is supported by our friends at MailChimp. We use MailChimp to send out our newsletters, and so do over 8 million other businesses. Visit MailChimp.com to learn more. So, um, just for context, where are we? We are at the Amy Farm, right off Route 100 in Pittsfield, Vermont, and uh, it is the most beautiful place in the world. We are looking at nearly a full moon, looking at the mountains. We've got 25 military cadets from West Point out on that mountainside trying to make their way to the top of the mountain. Okay, and what are they doing this for? So, we started something called the Agogi. So, Agogi was a... um, training ritual that was put on back in Sparta in the ancient world uh, to train young boys and get them ready to be warriors over a 10, 13 plus year period. Okay. And we are recreating that experience here over 60 hours. This is our first, this is a Gogi 000. This is our first, uh, first test run. That's awesome. Yeah. And the military guys, did you contact them? Did they contact you? They actually contacted me. Really? Uh, West Point had called, okay. and I went out and met with them. Uh, as you can imagine, it took a year going back and forth, yeah. and, and so you just happened to arrive on the night uh, it all came together. It's <laughs> really awesome. Yeah. So what um, what's going on? What are they doing? So no one knows uh, exactly what they're doing except me, and yeah. I, I don't know how much I can tell you because uh, that's that's what makes this special coming to Vermont and doing these things. Okay. But if you could imagine, let your imagination run wild, they're going to be hungry at a certain point. They don't have any food on them, and they're going to have to uh, eat. So, <laughs> so if you can imagine yeah. what, what that entails. Um, we are at a location now that is, I don't know, 30 or 40 miles from another location that they're going to have to be at at some point tomorrow. Um, there's an old crash, airplane crash site okay. way out in the mountains in that direction okay. that um, is going to be used tomorrow. And, and the whole goal of the weekend, unlike previous races yeah. we've put on, is to teach um, a whole bunch of attributes and, and teach people what it takes to be successful, what it takes to attain goals, what it takes to be a great human being. And I don't know, I've got this feeling that we learn, we being humans, we Mm -hmm. learn really well and more easily uh, when your back's against the wall and you're at a place where you just want water, food, and shelter. And so the goal is to get them to a place where they just want water, food, and shelter, maybe or maybe don't have it, Okay. and then teach them. Does this have a team element? Because I saw the death race. Uh, that was the first thing. Sure. Um, this will have yeah. this will have some team element to it tonight. Uh, again, this is the first beta run. Right. But but uh, they're already broken into teams. There'll be very individualistic components to it. Okay. Um, and and the breaking up of the teams and the individual components will probably test um, their integrity. Uh-huh. Right. Because because. Uh, I think it's really hard to stay part of a team uh, when the going gets tough. Absolutely. And, and there are members of the team that aren't maybe keeping up with with them. So we'll see. How long have these folks who are participating been together? Uh, you got here early on, so they're four or five hours into this. Now. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, and they're, are, being, they're and actually being. How hunt- long have they been in the army? Oh, they're West in point. the military three, four years now at military. Last year, um, okay. at West Point, so they, and and they um, know each other. They're yeah. being hunted right now by um, <laughs> by, by dogs. We've got um, we've got track dogs, you know, police police uh, canine units okay. that are uh, that are tracking them now. So if they get caught, 
they're they're brought back to where we're standing right now and and um and beaten literally literally okay how much of a lead did they get uh to the dogs well the dogs were actually set up there with the units and so then they and and the units didn't know the exact routes they were going to take and they didn't know okay. where the dogs were so uh so far two teams we were just uh, re- told on the radio have been caught um is there going to be a winner i don't know yet well i won't we'll, i'll know more on sunday on uh, how this all plays out but but the, the real goal <laughs> is um the real goal is for them to leave and say oh my god i can't believe how much i learned this weekend yeah absolutely so are you staying up the whole time i'm gonna stay up tonight i'm gonna let everybody else sleep and then we're gonna switch tomorrow okay. uh, i found over the last 15 years of putting these events on yeah that the first night is fantastic second night's great that third by the third night it starts to fall apart so i think we have to rotate uh our and, and we've got some amazing people here we've got uh some really high level military guys that are no longer in the military they're helping us so okay we got a good so- team so let's like step back a little bit. Yeah, um, yeah. I know I, I've heard the story, but I'm very interested in sharing it with the people listening. Sure. Uh, can you give us just the, the quick rundown of how Spartan came into being? Yeah. So I think I think it's a startup. It's a five year old startup that's 35 years in the making. And what I mean by that is my mom was very into yoga, meditation, health food back in the 70s and in, in Queens. And she really had a growth mindset. She really had a mindset that was, you know, anything is possible just because we do it. We being the public does something doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. She, she didn't buy into it. I think back then it was frowned upon to breastfeed and they were selling powdered milk. <laughs> um, I don't know if you remember this, if you're listening to the show right now, but uh, there were doctors that came on all day long on TV in lab coats and said, nine out of 10 doctors recommend smoking Marlboro or cigarettes or, I mean, it was it was a crazy time in human existence, and that's not it's not a rare time. This has happened for for yeah. a long period of time, and so she questioned everything. She questioned um, the way uh, society acted and the way that we lived, and she pushed my sister and I to new concepts, new ideas about religion, about um, yoga, about meditation, about being vegan. Uh, she found uh, the Transcendence Run in Queens, which was a ten-mile loop, a one-mile loop. Yeah, I've uh, heard about it. Three thousand uh, yeah. l- loops you had to run, fifty, sixty days. And so, as a young person, you see that and you start to realize, oh my God, everything's possible. You can, it's you just awesome. got to put your mind to it. And so, yeah. so Spartan really came from that. Okay. And and living that way over my yeah. last, you know, thirty-five years, and so. Uh, yeah, and okay. so for people listening, um, can you just describe a Spartan race, a normal Spartan race? Spartan race is a military-inspired obstacle uh, course. So if you can visualize walls and rope climbs and barbed wire and fire and uh, everything we put out on the course has got to be athletic in nature. It's uh, either three miles, um, eight miles, or 13 miles. A half marathon is our long distance. Typically, people that come into the Spartan um, tribe if you will, yeah. uh, want to complete all three distances. And, and we like that because we think that's transformational. We think that people um, that, that train for a year and attempt to do all those three events, all of us start and start eating healthier, yeah. going to bed earlier, they find new friends. We, we believe you're an average, and you've heard this before if you're listening, you're an average of your five best friends. And, and what something like Spartan does is it maybe gets you new friends or it transforms your friends. And so that pulls you up in life. And... Um, we also believe there's a big mental component. So although it's athletic in nature and we want to get this thing in the Olympics someday, we're really focused on this uh, idea of so what? Or if you're not cold, you're wearing too much. If you're not hungry, you're eating too much. And if you're not tired, you're sleeping too much, right? <laughs> and so that yeah. that idea of like living starts when your comfort zone ends um, is our whole ethos and the fabric of this company. And by the way, we didn't really invent it, right? I mean, Spartan's been around for yeah. a long time. The word means something. Um, there are a lot of people that died creating um, yeah. Spartan and, and everything it stands for. And so uh, we got really lucky. We got really lucky with the name. We got really lucky that everything came together. Yeah, it kind of lined up wonderfully and obviously fits your personality. It seems like so much of the brand is your vibe. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Okay, I've been wanting to ask you, um, Spartan Race now, is not the only one of its kind. Yeah. How do you compare yourself to those other obstacle races? So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of obstacle races around there in different parts of the world and certainly in the U.S. Um, 
but no one has the authenticity that we have. Yeah. N none of it comes from the place this comes from. They're, they're, they're not uh, living and breathing and designing it on a farm in Vermont mm -hmm. in waist deep snow or, or in the mountains during the summer, um, growing organic food and teaching people how to eat. So that doesn't mean that the competitors are bad or not as good. It's just different. Yeah, it seems like, so before you did this, you were in finance, right? In finance. Yeah. And one, one last thing, like yeah. if, this, if this was solely focused on business, when you asked what's the difference between you and your competitors, I would not be standing out here right now with 25 cadets that did not pay to participate and have them, you know, yeah. five canine units chasing them. Like, yeah. I'm doing this because I'm passionate about it. Oh, it's obvious. Like, you're, right. you're not doing this like, oh, man, this is so tough. You're yeah. not, we're standing up doing this interview in the middle of your field right now. Yeah. You're not in a lounge chair whining. No. Um, and that's kind of where I wanted to go. Like, so much of this Spartan and, like, the, you know, the roots and the branches of it seem to be, like, built into this philosophy. And, yeah. like how much of your time is spent talking about that versus actually executing events? Because now it seems like such a big part of the brand. Well, we have, we have a massive team that okay. builds, that builds our events and, and runs our business. Um, I've got some great executives back in Boston. Very early on, we realized we had to be in Boston or a major city okay. to run the business and, um, for hiring, for hiring purposes and just operationally. Okay. Um, I, I ran the business for two years out of Vermont here on the farm and it only attracted crazy people um <laughs> like, very passionate. like you yeah well very okay. passionate people that believe in the brand but the problem is people that really believe in the brand don't want to sit for 14 hours a day emailing yeah and and i get it because i don't want to do it um and and an environment like this is not conducive to sitting for 14 hours a day so i had i had to find a city where people do that and, okay. and and boston made the most sense and we we got this fantastic team people that kill themselves uh, to make it all happen. And, and so that allows me and a couple of other lunatics, uh, Jason, who's here, you can meet, who's, okay. we've had living in a barn now for three or four years. Like a style. Um, he, um, <laughs> I mean, I got stories about him, but, but, um, he, I mean, we, he's like our human tester. We, we test things on him. Okay. <laughs> we've had him out in the cold river in the winter for hours to see what happened. Um, to see what happens, <laughs> what's well, the like, test like? like is, what, what, is he dead yet? Metabolic rates would go up. Okay. Like, did he all of a sudden burn a lot? You know, how many more calories? That how much more did he need to eat? Okay. Um, all kinds. Of, we we went canoeing in the snow. Um, we pulled the canoe up the mountain first, and then canoed down the mountain. That's awesome. Um, okay. So we've done we've done some really um, scientific, but yet jackass kind of yeah. things out here that yeah. are, that that not a lot of people do. But but back to your question. Um, I'm able to uh, still push the limits on the brand and what it means because we have a great team that runs the business. Got you. And yeah. so you still do attract a certain degree of that in Boston, right? Like people, do you think people are at Spartan because they need a job mostly or are they at Spartan because they think? Listen, Spartan, yeah. first of all, uh, has struggles financially just because when yeah. you're growing as fast as we're growing and you charge as little as we charge for the events. Now, some people out there will say, well, gee, it costs 70 bucks, 80 bucks, 120 bucks. Yeah. That's great. But when you're building a $450,000, $500,000 obstacle course on the side of a mountain and uh, you have cost overruns and you've got to market the thing and fly your entire staff out there and put them up in hotels, yeah. $120 doesn't cut it. Yeah. Uh, you look at the New York Marathon, look at what they charge, look at an Ironman is $700 to sign up. There's a reason why that is it's very expensive to right. put on and they're events. not setting up obstacle courses either yeah and so and so when you ask about our team our team takes pay cuts yeah because the brand is so awesome and the mission is so great and we're doing such a fun thing that um yeah people are passionate about it and want to work here that's super cool could you um give us kind of just like a overview of how the finances have gone for spartan race like what they, did it start with gone in the out the window that's where they've gone. <laughs> yeah. They don't come in. They go out the window. There are no lights in Vermont, which yeah. helps you can keep the overhead yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, no. We we uh, listen. In the early days, we were, we were blowing through three hundred thousand dollars a month uh, to get the brand known just in the United States. We're in twenty countries now. Try doing that in twenty countries. Yeah, uh, it's a very very expensive proposition. And don't forget, we are doing things that 
you don't really have to do for the business and cost a fortune. What do I mean by that? We put out a food of the day. We put out a workout of the day. We've got a blog. We've got a magazine. Content, yeah. Enormous amount of content, podcast that we don't get paid for that um, is helping people transform and understand how to live the Spartan way, mm -hmm. but burns an enormous amount of cash. Yeah. Why would you do that? Because the mission is much greater than making some money. And at this point now, like, where are the people allocated in your company in terms of like what folks work on? Are they just like finding places to do events? How does that work? Well, you got a giant real estate team. You've got a giant content team. You've got a giant marketing team. You've got an international team. You've got a volunteer. I mean, just there's yeah. That's insane. How many people now? I mean, on any given weekend, like last weekend, we had four events going on at once. Okay. So that was four thousand people working at once. Right, a thousand at each location. So, um, so it's a it's a giant undertaking. Could you give us a just a ballpark numbers of what you were doing in the beginning and what you're doing now, revenue wise? I can't get into the exact. I'm going with Marion. Do you want to? Do you want to say? I got Colonel Nye next to me. You want to say anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Where are you going? You going to the top of the mountain? Yeah, with Marion. All right, I'll see okay. you. I'll see you up there. Yeah. Do am I waiting for a team to come down here? We don't know if they're coming. Copy. Copy that. Huh. So um, I can't get into revenue numbers, but I but I can tell you we hope to reach one million participants this year, and so you could just do the math. Okay. And when and we started out, we had seven hundred people, so seven hundred customers. There you go. Yep. Um, so have you guys raised money at any point? We've raised money. We're raising money again right now uh, because I'm out of money again. So it just seems to be, uh, it's like the old, there was an old movie you probably don't remember called The Money Pit. Okay. Hey. How are you doing? So far, pretty cool. Oh, you're doing a whole thing. No, that's yeah. fine. We're doing a podcast, but that's cool. Yeah. We have Peter next to us. Hey, Peter. Hello, everybody. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm talking. No, <laughs> go ahead. I, me, my role at Spartan, I'm not really sure what my role at Spartan is right now. Right now, I'm right trying Right now, he's running... He's running canine units on the side canine of a mountain. Units down, up and down the hillside. So that's well, you look pretty role. chipper given the situation. You know, I, You're just hanging out. There's nothing like watching a police dog chase after five scared cadets <laughs> two feet off their belt. <laughs> and the dog is going, or, 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 and the cadet is looking behind over their shoulder and they're running like the wind. And all you hear is the paintball dog going, tum, 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 tum. <laughs> very cool. Did not expect to see that. That is super cool. I'm very impressed and want to learn more about this. Are any, are any teams coming back down? No, I think all the teams, two teams have already made it through. Oh, good. Both with civilians on it, which is pretty cool. And nice. two yeah. cadet teams came back. Wow. Got it. And those second cadet teams are, have made it through? The, yeah, they've made it through. Oh, good. They're across the river. They're halfway up the hill. All right, so I'll see you at the top of the mountain. Yeah, I need to give you a ride. So. Got it. All right, okay. so wait for me. Um, so let's just jump back into the uh, raising money. You're talking about Money Pit for a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, why, like, why you, obviously you need to raise money to throw on more events, but as a business, why did you think it was a good idea to raise money? Uh, the second time or the first time? Uh, yeah, let's, if you the could give me time, both. We, I mean, I think both times I, I, I would, if I had to do it again, I would never raise money. Okay. Uh, I would never raise money because I don't want, I, this is me personally. I just don't want that pressure of investors that puts a lot of pressure on me, the individual. I've already got enough pressure on me cause I had an enormous investment myself Yep. and it dilutes me. Um, I've already got enough risk. Um, so it just brings another whole difficult element into the situation, but but I've got a gun to my head, so there's no choice. So the second time is because of the investors demanding growth? The second time is because I have a gun to my head yeah. and we need money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the uh, first time is because I had a gun to my head, so. Wild, okay. Um, is there an exit strategy? You know, listen, if, uh, I don't want to mention a brand's name, but if but if a brand that did not promote a healthy lifestyle came in and said, "Hey, we're going to give you a billion dollars for that business," yeah, it's it's hard for me to even say this, and I'm sure anybody listening wouldn't believe it. My answer would be no, because the amount of money I would receive would not outweigh me living the rest of my life thinking this thing was started to make people healthy, and here I am, I sold out. Yeah, if a company came in and we get calls every day. Um, that believe in everything we believe in and mm -hmm. we can ensure that the brand would stay intact and the mission would stay intact and it would never get diluted 
which which is almost impossible. Yes. But it, but if that if that could happen, if we can ensure that somehow, okay. And and it would give us big pocketbooks and the ability to really amplify the message and somehow go from servicing one million people to a hundred million people. Yeah. Just like McDonald's. Yeah. Did right, but yeah. in the reverse, we're, we're right. Like <laughs> I feel uh, like it's going to take a lot longer. Um. um then then. Yeah, yeah. We, we would do that because okay. at the end of the day, again, it's about changing lives. And so the faster, listen, if Walmart came in, yeah, and, right? I mean, some people laugh and say, we can't believe uh, Walmart selling organic vegetables. Well, guess what? That's a good thing. Yeah. Right? You've now got organic vegetables going to the masses. Yeah. So, so anyway. That's, yeah. Okay. So it totally makes sense. Yeah. Does that mean that um, the sponsorships you guys bring in, like, don't make a big enough dent, nearly big enough dent? They don't. We need uh, very specific sponsors. Um, we, I've been saying this for five years, right? It's no, it's no surprise that logistically we're challenged. So we need a UPS, FedEx, uh, United States Postal Service to sponsor us. So if you're listening, <laughs> the CEO of United States Postal Service happen, happens to be listening, um, we, we can use you. Okay. We need American Airlines as a sponsor because we're flying our people all over the world. Yep. We need Caterpillar as a sponsor because we need heavy equipment, right? So there's six categories, six industries that we need as sponsors that don't have to give us any money. That, by the way, there is no better company to sponsor. You have one million participants, think about this, that are broken while they're doing the race. I mean, they are busted and broken and they are being introduced to your brand. Yeah. When they come out the other side of that and they get to the finish line, they put on the metal, Caterpillar helped them do it. It's pretty awesome. Right? Yeah. The first, they probably would sell their Toyota and drive around a Caterpillar backhoe <laughs> after that, right? The so experience would be that awesome. In terms of like what's happening in the future, obviously there's this event going on right now. What else is in store for Spartan Race? Well, so Spartan's got to get to 42 countries to enter the Olympics. So I got 22 countries to go. Um, I'm obviously logistically challenged as we've talked about. So I got to, I got to tighten the bolts and the nuts and get, and get everything, um, running, running even better than it's running today. Mm -hmm. Um, we got a second NBC TV show coming out, which is awesome. And we're super excited about it'll be on mainstream NBC. The, the original show is on NBC, uh, sports. Okay. So yeah, everything's, everything's, um, coming together nicely. Okay. So I just have a few general questions in terms of stuff you've learned, uh, yeah. along the way. Um, what are the, I guess, yeah, spanning your whole career, uh, what are the greatest lessons you've learned in terms of running, starting and then executing running business? Um, I would say you've got to be extremely passionate. You've got to be relentless um, and you've got to be able to prioritize. Every day there are going to be a hundred things that come at you. And if you can't make quick, effective decisions and prioritize what's important, which fire today is about to burn the house down, okay. I could deal with, um, you're, not, you're going to be spinning your wheels. So how do you prioritize? You know, I, I do um, a quick analysis. I'm able to do a very quick analysis. Most people that run businesses are upside, downside decision making. So uh, what's the upside and what's the downside? And if the upside always downside, uh, it's a very easy decision. <laughs> okay. And and so a lot of people, for some reason, get paralyzed when, when making decisions. Uh, maybe they don't go through that simple exercise. Um, uh, to me, it's as simple as like I want to back into my parking spot because when I get out, it's easier to pull out, right? Yeah. And so, like, all my little decisions during the day are, are, are made that way. I don't waste time on phone calls because I've got other things to do. Um, now, some people might say, well, Joe, you're not very chatty. Okay, well, I'm not really, I mean, it sounds terrible, but I'm not really looking to make more friends. I have a lot <laughs> yeah. of friends already. I don't right. need any more. I need to get shit done today. You're also pretty efficient in how you communicate. Yeah. So, so that helps. Yeah. Um, okay. So then how do you actually spend your day? My day is uh, work out in the morning, uh, email all day, a couple phone calls, uh, go to bed, start over. That's it. Seven days a week? <laughs> Seven days a week. We did an interview. We don't take vacations and that's it. So we do. And it works. Well, <laughs> hopefully it's working. Hopefully yeah. you can shake the money tree again. Uh, yeah, we were interviewing a rancher. I, I do this podcast with a, a friend of mine. And uh, we were interviewing a rancher the other day uh, who's done super well in Georgia. And he's like, you know, if you want a modest living, all you got to do is work half the time, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, right. And I'm like, all right. No, that's right. That's yeah. right. It's um, I'm never off. Yeah. 
Every, I would say once a month I, I hit a wall where it's like, it happened the other day actually, it was 5 p.m. Okay. And um, I just said, I gotta go to bed. And so I went to bed, which is rare. And uh, I woke up at 3 a.m. And so I, I knocked out three hours of emails and that was six. That's awesome. Got my workout in. Like, it, actually, <laughs> it was pretty good. I felt refreshed, it was nice. So sometimes I hit a wall and then it's just uh, take a nap, get up, do it all over <laughs> just again. Just do it again. <laughs> yeah. Have you found there, are there any like, I don't know, I'm not like much of a life hack person guy, but do you have any like secrets, like things you've changed in your diet or exercise? Well, I, sh I mean, I'm drinking coffee right now, which is, I would say very rare, although in the last month or two, I, we live in Singapore now. I don't know if you know that. I moved my family to Singapore no. uh, eight, uh, eight weeks ago. So, why? Um, because I wanted to, this is so beautiful where we're standing right now in Vermont that I wanted to disrupt our lives. I okay. wanted to um, make things difficult on us. So I said, we're going to move to Singapore, put the kids in a bilingual school. And so we did it. Uh, but unfortunately, I had to leave and come back here to do a bunch of stuff uh, like this thing we're doing tonight. And um, and so I've been drinking coffee for like the last three weeks being in the U.S. And and so if you're asking me, listen, it's it's, it's easier to be on all the time and work a lot if, if, if you're limiting the amount of food you're eating, yeah. uh, making the food healthier. Like eating less is actually much more energetic yeah. and, and right, just less stuff, less ingredients. <laughs> One simple thing people can do is don't drink anything but water. And every time you eat out, tell them no salt. Just do hmm. those two things. No salt, and 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 you get plenty of salt anyway. Don't you don't have to worry about not getting enough salt intake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just not eating salt. I don't eat gluten anymore. That helps. Oh wow. Okay. Less do you it, drink less alcohol. Is more. I don't drink alcohol. I mean, I might have a sip of wine once a month just because everybody's drinking a glass of wine. I, they yeah. all think I'm a freak to begin with. So. <laughs> It seems like you're squarely in that camp now, so you almost couldn't do anything. They'd be like, oh, it's fucking Joe. Yeah, it's that's like, Joe. Cool. That's Joe. Yeah. Uh, do you eat meat? I do. When I'm in okay. the mood tonight, I was uh, debating if I would eat a burger, but my, my mind said no. So um, okay. I don't even like the taste of coffee. I just don't. Yeah, I, I prefer water and less stuff. But um, yeah. I found that taking alcohol out of my diet is actually like the number one oh, thing to feel powerful. Change. Yeah, you cut out alcohol, cut out salt, like four or five things. Game changer. It's crazy. Game changer. It's totally nuts. Um, all right, man. Uh, just a couple more. Um, mm. What are the worst choices you've made in, in life? Spark uh, well, well, sure. Life in and life. business and everything. The, the worst choices we all make, me included, are the ones that gain you instant gratification. So every time you're making those decisions and you're deciding uh, between the upside and downside, if it's because you want something now, uh, for example, if you're in the middle of a race and you're just exhausted and it's easier to quit because it would feel good now, that is a bad decision. Mm -hmm. However, if you're bleeding and you might die, then it's a good decision to quit the race. <laughs> so so um, most of the decisions we make because we want something right now are bad decisions okay. and and uh it is no different for me any decision i've made in life that was but i want to make more money now or i want to do this now or i want to can you think about it you're, if you have a relationship with a woman yeah. or, or if you're a woman out there and have a relationship with a man and you're out and you're flirting with somebody um that instant gratification will be a disaster it yeah. will wreak havoc in your life one of the things I'm teaching the cadets tonight is um, values and beliefs, right? So values are the targets in your life. Those are the things you want to achieve. Like you want to be really healthy. You want to have a great family. You want to have a great relationship. Those mm -hmm. are the targets. The beliefs are the spears that you're throwing at those targets. So if you believe it is okay to smoke a cigarette on the weekends or a cigar, but you value being healthy, well, your arrow is not going to hit your target. If you value relationship, but you believe it's okay to flirt, well, your arrow is probably not going to hit the target. Yeah. So that's how you need to make your decisions and not make mistakes. And anytime, anytime I've made mistakes, uh, it, it's my, my belief system uh, it falls into went, that. went haywire. Yeah. So now that you've created Spartan Race, um, and it obviously has this whole ethos around it, this content machine around it, do you think that most new modern companies need that to fuel them, or is that specific to what you're doing? We're very lucky. Um, human beings in general today, especially first world countries, need some way to define themselves. And for years, we've defined ourselves with material things. Right? Okay. We wanted to obtain more and more material things, so we define ourselves with Gucci bags or uh, fancy cars or whatever it is. Um, 
it's easier and healthier to define yourself with great experiences. And, and now there are tools to share those experiences, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Yeah. So we just happen to have a kick-ass name, a kick-ass brand. I'm not saying because we're just lucky, right? Leonidas created it. I didn't. <laughs> um, actually, it was Insurgis, right? So okay. um, we have this awesome brand that people can define themselves with that lends itself to being a content. We're more media company than we are anything else. Yeah. Um, the problem is that we're not a bunch of media guys and we're not monetizing any of that. Um, well, we, we just kind of. love making people breathe heavy and sweat and, and really just look at life differently. Like, so like, like harder is better. Cold shower is better. No couch is better. <laughs> That's a tough sell. It's tough, but, but I will say you're able to beat the drum really well. Like in preparing for this you know i listen to all the books and whatever and yeah. like listen to every interview yeah. uh because i've heard a lot of the lines like yeah. and it, this is i'm really glad to having like broken off a little bit from what you normally talk about yeah. um do you wish you had joined the military i think i do when i was in college i used i think back to the friday nights like most friday nights in college kids would probably be out partying i didn't party if i went out three times in four years it was a lot uh, I mm -hmm. was really just trying to study because I didn't do well in high school and I wanted to catch up. Yeah, I was really focused, really proud of myself getting through uh, an Ivy League school. was a, was a big deal for me. First one in my family to go to college, uh, and I found myself. This is going to sound crazy and weird, but I was like folding my underwear and clothes on Friday nights, doing my laundry, getting <laughs> shit together so that Monday I'd be that far ahead. And yeah, and so when you ask that question, I think back. Well, shit, I probably would have been a military guy, but part of me thinks because I didn't have. No one introduced me to the military. I didn't know much about yep. it. Um, I came from a neighborhood where everybody went to jail. So I think in the back of my head, oh, I had this idea wow. of, well, maybe that happens someday, you know, like, like, yeah. cause that's what people went. That's, that was like, yeah, yeah. that was their college. If, uh, if someone were thinking about doing a Spartan race, uh, what would you say to them? Um, just do it. Don't even think about it. Just do it. Um, if you, if you've never exercised before, I tell people just walk a mile a day, do 30 burpees, 30 pull-ups. And, and if you can find some Bikram yoga because, uh, Bikram yoga fixes everything. Thanks for checking out our first episode. If you'd like to listen to another, we posted one with Jim Andaloro. He's a sheet metal manufacturer from Georgetown, Mass. He's got a pretty funny story. After he sold his company in the 90s, he took a part-time job selling TVs. I came across a competitor. He goes, are you fucking kidding me? You're working here? He <laughs> was a competitor of mine, you know? So I sold him a TV. <laughs> so I just needed time to chill out. So if you'd like to follow along with what we do and some of the extra stuff we, you know, capture and create while we're uh, out recording these interviews, we think you should check out our MailChimp newsletter. We send out photos. We send out all kinds of other stuff with every single episode. So if you go to saltpodcast.com, uh, you can sign up for that. And thanks again to MailChimp for supporting the show. See you next week.